Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. How will a new U.S. president affect Seattle city government? Why is the city council pursuing new hazard pay for certain workers during the pandemic? And what's the latest in the stalemate between the city and its largest police union, now working with an expired contract? The council's budget chair, council member Teresa Mosqueda, joins me to answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. It's not just about training. We need to change the ways in which officers engage yep. with the community. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And joining us is Council Member Teresa Mosqueda from the Council's Position 8 seat here, the Council's Budget Chair. Council Member Mosqueda, thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to jump right into it with you. I think that, like a lot of us, you were holding your breath as our country inaugurated a new president, Joe Biden, for many different reasons here. We didn't have any armed protest really around the country. That's a good sign here. But I, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. This transfer of power to the Biden-Harris administration was a very emotional moment, but it's also one that could impact operations and policies for the city of Seattle. Can you talk about that, please? Um, I know that un unlike um, the last four years, we now know that we have a partner in the federal government. I now feel like we can all take a, um, a moment to breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that there's folks in the federal government who believe in science and are looking at this pandemic with the urgency that it requires. We have over 400,000 people in our country who have died. We have now seen a record number of people die in one day, over 420 some people in one day die. In California, 10 people are dying, something like every few minutes. This is a crisis that yes, there is light at the end of the tunnel now. We are so thankful the vaccines are beginning to roll out. Um, but when I say a moment to take a breath, Yesterday was a really exciting day to watch the swearing in, especially of the uh, first woman, woman of color, vice president, um, to know that we have democratic control over the House and the Senate and Congress, and to know that there is uh, immediate relief, especially for our Muslim brothers and sisters who saw the end to the racist and horrific executive order under the Trump administration go away with the swipe of a pen from the Biden administration. It was a moment of relief. But we have to work quickly. We have to work with urgency, both to hold these new electeds accountable and to work in partnership to get the funding that we need and the support we need to uh, really make sure that we stop the end of yeah. um, the dying that we're seeing yeah. related to COVID. So yeah, and I'm optimistic, but yeah. I also know that there's so much more to do. Of course. And I wanted to talk about the pandemic uh, first off with you and look at the public side or public health side of this because you serve on the King County Board of Health. The state's vaccine notification system has had a little bit of a glitchy start. There's a waiting game so far in getting some of these vaccines out to our area from the feds. It sounds like things are ramping up at the county level with some max mass vaccination sites supposed to come online soon. What can you tell us the latest here, Teresa, about this? Um, well, I'm really actually very proud of Seattle. I'm proud of the partnership that we've had with the state government and also with King County Public Health. Everybody that I've talked to in public health and in King County has said that the city has been a good partner. And so for that, I'm very grateful. I thank the Durkin administration and the uh, four or five folks who are truly leading the effort for our city in partnership uh, with these other jurisdictions. We have to be working together to make sure that the um, vaccines are rolling out and getting into people's arms as soon as possible. I'm very thankful for our firefighters who've been working together with um, social workers and uh, public health to get vaccines to the arms. Yeah, going we door have, to door there, yeah. They yeah. are, yeah. We mm -hmm. have two mobile vaccination teams. They have gone out to places like adult family homes. They've vaccinated nearly a thousand residents so far. They're working with places like local pharmaceutical, um, sorry, local pharmacies and mm -hmm. the incredible team um, of the pharmacy representatives to make sure that more adults, especially adults over 65 now have access to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And um, in partnership with our housing uh, partners like Seattle Housing Authority, yeah. Bellwether, Seattle Chinatown International District Pres Preservation and Development Authority, we're going into housing that basically serves our most vulnerable uh, mm -hmm. low-income adults and uh, folks who are elderly. That's right. what it's gonna take to make sure that we inoculate as many people as possible. And we really have to continue to dispel any of the myths out there mm -hmm. 
very safe vaccine. My parents get vaccinated this Friday. And I am the, the sigh of relief that I have that now uh, soon our daughter will be able to see their grandparents um, when they get vaccinated. It's just, it's, um, I can't even describe it. And so, you know, once they get their uh, second round of vaccine in the next three weeks, they're going to be 95% free mm -hmm. or basically right. inoculated from right. uh, COVID. So we got to get everybody vaccinated. And I'm just so yeah. thankful for our team in Seattle who's working really hard to vaccinate yeah. as many people as possible. Yeah, my, my parents are getting vaccinated the day we're taping the show. So I know how you feel. This is something pretty important here. I, I want to talk about COVID's impact on the economy. Uh, the council has been working with some of these small businesses with grants. There's cash assistance available to hospitality workers. And the week we're taping this show, you're sponsoring some new legislation. You're asking for four bucks more an hour in hazard pay for grocery store employees during the declared pandemic emergency. I'm trying to figure out why these workers specifically should get hazard pay. I noticed convenience store clerks, for example, were not included in this proposal. What's the idea behind this? Well, let's talk about grocery store workers. We okay. call these workers essential. Uh, we recognize that they are putting food on our tables. They're allowing for us to be able to have access to daily household needs that allow for our families to be healthy, safe, and fed. Those workers have told me stories about how they're in grocery stores stocking shelves during the middle of this pandemic, and they feel the breath coming out of people from around their masks. But more um, scary, there's folks walking around grocery stores with their masks under their nose, around their chin. We've seen stories from um, studies across the nation that have looked at grocery store employees and looked at the higher rates of incidents for contracting COVID, and it is shocking. They were five times as likely to contract COVID as a grocery store worker stocking shelves, interacting with um, mm. customers on a daily basis than those who did not have to work on the floor around customers. Folks who are stocking our grocery shelves, making sure that families have food, that we have the toilet paper that we need right now, they've been working 24 seven since the beginning of this pandemic. And they deserve to be treated as essential they are sacrificing their lives and their health, and they should not be sacrificial. Seattle is not alone in considering um, a hazard pay ordinance. The city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, Montebello in California, Oakland and San Jose this week and next. So at the end of January and beginning of February, they are passing similar ordinances. $4 more an hour, making sure that folks actually have the resources that they need to compensate them for putting their lives on the line. And some of these cities are actually considering five dollars an hour okay. why is this increased pay important i know of a story of a grocery worker here in seattle she has decided that she had to make a decision between whether or not she kept her job and thus mm. had to keep her child care and pay for child care or continue to pay for her apartment mm. knowing that she needed to provide for her kiddo mm -hmm. she kept her job she's paying for child care but she's sleeping in her car now this okay. should never happen in Seattle. And our grocery store workers on the front line, um, they ought to be compensated during this time. We know that they're probably not gonna get their vaccines for at least another four months. So yeah. in the time being, let's at least compensate them. Okay, and I know we'll see a lot more about that in committees over the next little bit here. So I wanna move on to some police department issues here. Chief Adrian Diaz recently noted that Seattle saw a big spike in homicides last year, 50 of those cases in 2020. Here's what he said about that number at his press conference in early January. That represents a 61% increase or 19 additional people who were murdered this year. This was the highest number of murders in 26 years. This is unacceptable and we cannot tolerate this level of violence. So what's your reaction to that number, especially in relation to the chief's concerns about SPD staffing levels with a 17% cut to SPD's budget in 2021? So Brian, it's really important to remember that homicides are up across this country. This is a symptom of a you know, consequence of the pandemic as well. Stress is very high. There's a lot of people without jobs right now. There's a lot of folks who are not able to access the mental health counseling that they need and the services that they need. This is something that Seattle is grappling with along with the entire country. And when we talk about the work that Seattle and so many other cities are doing, Austin, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, New York, we're talking about freeing up officers to do the important work of investigation, of protecting folks instead of being across our city in places that they don't need to be carrying a gun. 
we're talking about making sure that more officers have time to investigate and hopefully prevent um, those type of uh, homicides. So let me give you a few examples. Okay. What we have done over the last few months in Seattle and the last year is we've helped to remove armed officers from showing up for fender benders. We're trying to get officers who are carrying guns to mm -hmm. not be the first responders for mental health calls. Because even okay. though we triage health calls to firefighters, mental health calls still go to our police department. Yeah. That's just not right. And when yeah. we think about how we can reduce gun violence, one mm -hmm. of the most important things we can do for youth, for young adults, for folks overall, is to create greater stability, access to social resources, make sure okay. people have access to counseling, and that all reduces gun violence. Okay. It goes hand in glove with the work that we've tried to do last year. And I, like the chief and uh, folks from across the country, we need to act to reduce yeah. this gun violence that we're seeing. But Seattle is not alone in those yeah. statistics. Yeah. And, and let me keep going down this path, though, with regard to public safety. The city is really transitioning this year in a lot of different ways, shifting its 911 call center to a new department here, using the HOPE team instead of the police-led navigation team to work on unauthorized homeless encampments. I have some viewers who have some questions about this. One of them writes this. Given the new public safety focus on non-SPD service providers, what communication and accountability framework will be accessible to neighborhood residents and businesses? How to collaborate or provide feedback locally on ongoing safety issues? This is a writer, Teresa, who's in Ballard, especially concerned about homelessness there, doesn't believe these new social service-based systems are transparent enough, doesn't think they're accountable to the public. What do you think about that? So. The data shows us when you lead with officers, uniformed and armed officers walking into a place where people are vulnerable, sleeping outside, the first thing that people might do is pack up their stuff and go to another park, go to another mm -hmm. corner or a place in Seattle. Okay. That is not solving homelessness. That just means that your neighbor down the street, you know, maybe in Magnolia instead of in Ballard, is seeing that same individual living outside without the needed services that they need. So when folks are asking for transparency, let's look at the data. When you okay. lead with social workers, when you come into these um, encampments with mm -hmm. a trusted social worker and help get folks inside, that actually reduces the number of people that are outside. And these okay. are not new brand, brand new organizations. These are award-winning sure. national organizations like mm -hmm. LEAD and REACH right. and organizations right here in the city of Seattle who've been helping to get folks inside. So yeah. I agree with the folks who are upset about sure. seeing people outside on our of curb course. side in our alleys, in our parkways. They should yeah. not be there. But on an average night, there was only one bed open for an enhanced yeah. shelter. Mm -hmm. And we have a problem when our shelters are at capacity because we haven't right. built the housing to get folks sure. out of shelter. Both we'll just, of those things must happen though, right? We have to have I, housing yep, and we need course. to lead with trusted partners um, in our new HOPE team. Just interacting with those trusted partners though, I mean, beforehand it was a cop with a badge number or something along those lines. How do people interact with those groups now? I think that's the part of the question here. Okay, great question. So there is a handful of organizations, including REACH and uh, LEAD. Yeah. These organizations are working together with the city, with the Human Services Department. Okay. They're call being called to respond to certain encampments that they see. And what I've heard, especially from one of the encampments that's happening right now, mm -hmm. is that these trusted partners, when they've gone in, they've had a 100% success rate with getting some folks into the hotel rooms that the council funded right. in this budget, right? So we're acting quickly to get folks into hotels, motels, like the mm -hmm. one that that folks might not realize is how helping to house folks temporarily at a low hot end. That's a great example of where social service providers yep. partnered with that room, that mm -hmm. door, the roof to provide security, right. actually help stabilize folks and get them into housing. Okay. And um, we can do uh, more. I'm going to be taking that question back to make sure that we um, put out some more information about ways yeah. that our neighbors can yeah. engage more with the with the new home program. Yeah, I know we just saw some new co-lead stats out. So a lot going on with this issue for sure. I wanna talk about another uh, police public safety issue. This has to do with the head of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, Mike Solon. He made some comments about the insurrection at our nation's capital on January 6th that the council, the mayor, a lot of people didn't like. Uh, you and many others called on him to resign. He says he's not going to step down. So I'm trying to figure out how that impacts creating a new contract and building the public's trust in our police department. Spog had a contract that expired on December 31st. It doesn't help build the trust at all. I think uh, President Sloan has, um, President Solon has um, shown that he has people within his ranks that have been following in many ways his words, his call for um, greater division, and that's not going to help bring the city back together. 
I don't think that he's the right person to lead the discussions about how to rebuild trust with our community. We need partners who are recognizing the moment that we are in in this nation that require us to rethink where our officers should be deployed and how we can rebuild trust with the community. Yeah. Recognizing that officers across this um, country have also seen that the increase in officers does not actually um, help with decreasing some of the crime or the homicides that you just mentioned. Yeah. Let's take, for example, what happened in New York. We have James yeah. McCabe, a retired New York Police Department official who's traveling around the country, and he continues to say, as quoted in the US, um, USA Today, mm -hmm. New York City made a conscious decision to reduce the number of cops, and crime continued to go down. Yeah. It's not what you have, it's how you are working and what you are doing with those officers. That's the kind of mentality that we need in an elected official within the SPA uh, uh, organization. Yeah. And frankly, the type of mentality that we need to also see within the executive to make sure that we're working towards this new vision of what reimagined policing could be. Yeah. Yeah, I want to take this issue a little bit further because at the state level, there's a lot of work going on right now when it comes to how police unions like SPOG should be allowed to arbitrate when it comes to matters of police officers getting disciplined. So a lot going on here. The city's lobbying team has been in Olympia, or at least tracking this from Olympia remotely here and uh, doing it virtually. Uh, there's one bill that tries to streamline the way the appeals happen for police, another that goes even further, saying unions should not be allowed to arbitrate discipline for officer misconduct. I know you have a background in labor organization. We got in a question on this issue to you in particular. It goes like this. If Councilmember Mosqueda is pro-labor and pro-union, pro why does she single out and target police unions while not changing rules for any other group? Isn't that discrimination? A little bit of mustard on that one. So I, I just wanted to talk about this because some of the state's larger labor groups have concerns about these issues too. So do you support this idea of not allowing unions to arbitrate at all in matters of police misconduct or where do you stand on this? Well, I think that's a very misleading question. I don't okay. actually think that there's a handful of folks um, who would agree with um, President Solon's approach to any of the work that he's been engaged in, um, mm -hmm. in terms of his response to, you know, now five officers showing up at the insurrection. This was mm -hmm. an attempted coup. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of solidarity across labor in recognizing that we have to do a much better job at um, uh, ensuring that this type of behavior that we saw on January 6th is never replicated. Mm -hmm. And that does not mean hiding behind a union badge. Mm -hmm. That does not mean hiding behind uh, collective bargaining. And when we talk about needing to bargain at the table, the city of Seattle also should be a leader from the management side. Yeah. We should not be sort of saying, hey, we got to kick the can down the road. And if the legislature acts, then maybe we'll do a better job bargaining. No, we have a responsibility right now to be um, a better player at the at the bargaining table and to really stand up for the call to action that was uh, called for in the consent decree and continues to be called for from our community partners. There is nothing incongruent about my position standing for um, hardworking men and women, our brothers and sisters and siblings in the labor movement who need to fight to make sure that their voice is represented in grocery store working and and trucking and making sure that our nurses who are on the front line right now can speak up and say out loud when their life is on the line mm -hmm. and their health and safety is at risk in their workplace and there's nothing incongruent about saying that we need workers to be able to have a good living wage to afford to live in the city that they work so um, i would make sure that the individual who wrote in knows that that is a um a misleading question at best mm -hmm. Okay. And what we need to do, what I'm committed to doing, especially sitting right here, is making sure that we're not kicking the can down the road, yeah. bargaining now, because that contract is actually expired. Yeah. And we need to do a better job at the table of showing what it looks like to lead with integrity as an employer and yeah. demand things at the bargaining table um, that we have the right to do right now. Yeah, I know the state working on this issue, too, that could give the city a boost in some of those negotiations too. So we're gonna keep an eye on that right here on, on Seattle Channel. I, I wanted to talk about one final police issue that's getting talked about right now, uh, crowd control tactics for police. So the city put a ban on a number of things, including blast balls, rubber bullets, et cetera, back in June. The federal judge overseeing the consent decree process struck that down, said it to go through the right processes. So now the council's working on this with some input from the public and the Community Police Commission, the Office of Police Accountability, the Inspector General too. I'm trying to figure out what sort of changes to crowd control tactics you would like to see come out of, uh, out of all this. 
So I am still a firm believer that we should be banning them outright, just like the city council did. It was a unanimous vote. Um, it is something that um, is the right response to when we receive public testimony from parents of n a nine month old who was foaming at the mouth in his crib mm. because of the type of gas that was being deployed nightly for mm. over a week in the Capitol Hill area. He and his wife went in because they heard their infant, a nine month old, choking and coughing and they saw foam coming out the mouth. They had to evacuate their apartment in Seattle, in mm. Capitol Hill, because that type of weapon was being used on people who were protesting outside in a very, in the densest neighborhood in our city. Right. So when I think about what we need to do, it's to make sure that that experience is never, never replicated across the city. That right. a, a seven year old is never sprayed in the face for going to a peaceful protest. Yeah. And that what we actually have is de-escalation strategies. Okay. These folks have been trained on de-escalation. Yeah. <laughs> they have, um, we have put an immense amount of money into training. And the mm -hmm. thing that we should be doing is allowing folks to express their first amendment right, obviously not allowing for there to be arson or vandalism, sure. but that does not mean throwing gas bombs into a largely peaceful crowd like we experienced for almost 10 days in June. Right. Um, I think that we are not alone in trying to get rid of sure. OC spray, flashbangs, uh, launchers, and crowd control tactics. And let's not forget as well, these were mm -hmm. used against journalists, yeah. International journalists, members of CNN got hit with these um, grenades. We mm -hmm. had members of our own press corps here in the city of Seattle who experienced getting hit in the face with um, with tear gas as well. Okay. That's a crime. Okay. We should be making sure that um, legal observers and medics are never in harm's way, which they were repeatedly in the city of Seattle by our mm -hmm. own officers. That's yeah. the type of behavior that we shouldn't have to wait for the Office of Police right. Accountability to investigate when it right. is clear those are violations and those folks should be penalized. But it, it seems like there's been a change, I guess, over the past several years, because this is a situation where these types of less lethal weapons, at least a couple of decades ago, were approved as way to break up crowds or whatever else. And I know things have changed in between then and now, but I'm looking at that. I think some officers out there, and really the federal judge involved with this too, said, hey, if we just give uh, these officers batons and guns, then we could have even further problems. Do you understand that line of reasoning with this? It makes no sense that somebody would default to using lethal mm. options if they don't have these less, less lethal weapons. Okay. You know, when we talk about de-escalation de -escalation strategies, when we talk about rebuilding trust with community, we yeah. spend a lot of time training. This is one way that we're also showing it's not just about training. We need to change the ways in which officers engage yeah. with the community. Mm -hmm. My own father was sprayed in the face uh, about 10 years ago with tear gas while he was standing on the curb at a peaceful protest. I have friends who have experienced having their hand permanently impaired because of rubber bullets while at peaceful protests. Mm -hmm. And again, this summer, we saw children at these protests, mm -hmm. at these rallies at the very beginning mm -hmm. that were met with this type of reaction. So yeah. it is about changing the way officers engage yep. with crowds and making sure that those who are lighting fires yeah. or um, breaking breaking windows, that individuals are singled out. They have tactics to do that. It does not require um, you know, spraying and sending in um, these these bombs into yeah. large crowds that include um, journalists, medical observers, Got it. I'm sorry, medics and legal observers, along with um, children sometimes. Sure, sure. I, I want to move on here and talk about the future of progressive revenue in our city and our state, too, here. The Jumpstart program that you sponsored, payroll tax on big businesses just went into effect at the start of the year. Uh, some businesses, of course, are pushing back on this, but I'm trying to focus on what's next year because the state is still working on this regional progressive revenue plan, too. I wanted to talk about that if Jumpstart, I guess, gets uh, stopped if that state plan goes through. And also, are there other plans that the city council might have when it comes to pr progressive revenue this year? What's on your plate? So our state partners um, in the state legislature have been tremendous. Uh, you might remember that last year they tried to pass a progressive uh, payroll tax as yep. well. Um, when that didn't pass at the state level in 2020, what I did along with our colleagues on council and a huge coalition that included large and small businesses, labor and housing folks, and Green New Deal advocates along with transit advocates, we pulled together a large coalition that recognized that there is a difference right now in a post-COVID world of who is doing very well in terms of these largest corporations mm. and the small mom and pop shops that we see closed down on the corner. 
Yeah. And we need to be able to invest back into those small mom and pop shops, into the workers, into the um, health and housing of our city in order for us to get out of this recession more quickly. That mm -hmm. is what the data shows. Okay. For From the Center for Public Interest, they've looked at lots of data from the last recession, 2008 yeah. to 2010. Mm -hmm. And they showed that the worst thing that we can do is to not invest in government services and yeah. into making sure folks have housing and social services that they need. That I austerity see. budgeting in this time actually hurts the private sector. It prolongs recessions. And so what you saw, for example, from Seattle Restaurants United, who wrote yeah. an amazing piece, mm -hmm. is that they don't agree that right. um, the chamber is representing them. And they've said that what we need in this time is the actual investments that Jumpstart is allowing. And, you know, yeah. just, just a few weeks ago, we were able to get $5 million more million out the door yeah. for restaurants and hospitality workers. That's in addition to the millions, tens of millions that we got out this summer because we were able to rely on Jumpstart funding coming in. Got it. I need to start wrapping up with here, and I'm going to go back to the mailbag here. We've got another question coming in uh, from Logan, who writes, there is no longer a single family-sized dwelling for sale anywhere in the city that's affordable to the median family. What's the council have on their agenda for these families that want to own a, own a home and don't qualify for subsidies? Thank you very much for the question. Any thoughts on this one as we start wrapping up? There is so much work that we have not done to um, to finish our efforts to create more housing. And folks might know we've done a lot in the last three years, but the land disposition bill that said the city needs to stop selling pri public land to the highest mm -hmm. private bidder and actually build housing on that. We helped to make sure that there was more dollars going into the Office of Housing for building housing and then community preference to bring back folks who are more likely to be displaced. And we're creating denser housing options in the areas we currently have that are allowed to be up zone, but we haven't done enough, especially when 75, 80% of our land is still zoned for single family homes and not the duplexes, triplexes, or the small apartments yeah. like the one I used to live in. So Logan and everybody in Seattle, okay. this is the item to do. We have got to create additional density throughout our city, mm -hmm. allow for duplexes, triplexes, um, flats, more row houses, townhouses. This is going to help create more uh, housing opportunities and then partnering that it's not just about supply. It's about making sure that those first time home owner, um, mm -hmm. you know, folks who desire to own their first time uh, home, that mm -hmm. they get the assistance they need to yeah. make that first purchase and that we have more co-ops, co-housing right. options uh, that really draw down the cost. This is you the know, biggest issue and the biggest social equity issue to work on. We can sneak in 20 seconds here. Teresa, you went through two separate budget processes last year as chair, a massive amount of work. Is it your New Year's resolution not to do that again in 2021 or 22nd version here? What are your New Year's resolutions moving forward? So related to the budget, uh, we learned a lot in the last year. I think there's a lot we can do to streamline the process and make it more transparent. Folks be on the lookout for some really exciting budget transparency and accountability items we're going to be putting out this year. All right. Thank you very much for that. We'll see you next time on Council Edge.